just incorporating the product is not enough because yes if you're not doing right you will come off as salesy you will come off as like pushy and we've all we've all seen it when the product is kind of shoehorned in and you're halfway through a piece and there is a cta that starts blinking at you that's not what we're talking about when we're talking about product like content we're talking about weaving the product into a piece of content seamlessly so that it's actually part of the story that you're trying to tell there are different ways a product can show up blink and you miss it a direct mention and finally there is a third level the integral part of the narrative where your product becomes um it's woven into the, the story as it's a crucial plot point. I would say that this is a really customer-centric way to do content, actually, is showing the product. I know it's a controversial thing to say, but um, yeah, that's what I think. Tell me about your content marketing philosophy and how it has evolved over time. Okay, so I think to answer this question, I need to go back to 12 or 13, maybe even 14 years ago when I was just getting started. Now, I come from an academic research background. So the lens through which I looked at content marketing was through the element of education, of sharing and transmitting information, creating content that you know taught people how to do something they couldn't do before or inspired them to do something they didn't even know they could do. Around that, there is a layer of me spending years on content marketing teams that were part of acquisition teams. So in addition to the educational element, there was always an element of creating content that actually drives some sort of tangible business result or growth. And still around all of this, I've also always gravitated towards um, brands and using content to express um, a brand's personality uniquely, create differentiation, making sure that people know that the piece of content is coming from you. So I think at this point, I'm at a point where these things are converging quite nicely in my brain. And um, so I like to create an edit content that is educational, that can drive or at least be tied to business results, and that can stand out from the rest because of its personality. I think that's it. What a mouthful. Yes. <sighs> I think that's fantastic. And the question uh, about that is like, with your research background, how is that played into the way that you look at customer research and the way that you look at content research and all of that? I spent four years working on one single piece of content, which was my PhD thesis. So I learned a lot about being a thorough researcher and going after really good sources, learning what a good source versus a not so good one was. And in that, my PhD was quite practical. So I had to interview a lot of people, um, a lot of audiences. I brought in qualitative data, etc. And I think that kind of mindset of doing rigorous research, both quantitative and qualitative, making sure that you're using sources that you can, you know, back up and credit properly that are accurate, um, and doing all of this while trying to explain a complex concept in relatively simple words, even though academic jargon is a bit of a problem, but, you know, doing all of that, I think, kind of really shaped my understanding moving into content marketing that um, I was still doing, I, I just still need to be as rigorous as before, even more so, actually, because a PhD might be read by five or ten people who have a very niche interest in the thing I'm interested in. But a piece of content can legitimately be seen by hundreds of thousands of people if you're working for a very successful company or publication. So you have to be even more precise um, so you don't share um, fake news or fake information or you don't create, uh, you know, um, you actually don't make people do more work than, than what they came to you for. So if you're creating content about something and that leaves people making assumptions about what it is that you're trying to say or if if it makes them want to google how to do a thing after they read your piece because you were very unclear about it then you've just added more work and work that they don't need to do because you're the expert you're supposed to be helping them now when i was at quickbooks we had done a research study with a number of different customers and what we had found Right now, this was when I when I was in charge and I was very much in the anti product camp. Right. I think a lot of people are. We're afraid to do it. We're afraid to do it in a way that kind of comes off as salesy. And what I found when we did the research project and the thing that really surprised us both on the global side and on the on the domestic side was that people actually wanted 
that. They wanted to know what products we had that would solve these problems that we were talking about. And they didn't want to beat around the bush. They wanted to see they had a problem they needed to solve and they wanted to find a way to do it. I am glad that you actually have some data to back this up because I think it's really important uh, to just, I mean, I, I felt that this was the right way forward, but actually knowing that there is some data that proves it right, that's, that's great. So what I, what I was thinking about was, you know, in this mission to be educational and paying attention to customers, et cetera, what you want to do is to offer help. So if somebody comes to you with, with a problem, and not only you can provide the solution by explaining how the problem is solved or how the job is done through writing, but if you have a piece of software or, or a service that actually helps them do the thing, why on earth would you not tell them? Why are you hiding it? I think a lot of the time, one of the, uh, one of the things I hear, and you just mentioned before, is that you run the risk of being salesy, not very you know, audience friendly while showing a product. I want to make the opposite argument. I want to I want to say that the way to be audience friendly is to make them do less work. So if you have a solution, actually a way of being audience centric is to show it to them right there and then so they don't have to make assumptions, they don't have to do more work, they don't have to follow links that take them to a product page or a landing page or whatever. Show it there and then. That's a way to help. That's a way to help them familiarize themselves with the solution both in theory and in practice. It's just I don't know. I think it's just really, yeah, I would say that this is a really customer centric way to do content actually is showing the product. I know it's a controversial thing to say, but um, yeah, that's what I think. Well, one of the things that we found too, because I had this huge existential crisis around <laughs> that, right? How do you do it? How do you do it tastefully, right? How do you do it without it feeling like you're, you're jamming a product down somebody's throat? Like, yeah. This is always a huge problem. And I think something that a lot of us had and, and, and something that I found, right? And you and I talked about this on our pre-call, but um, something that I found was really helpful and it helped us build connections within the organization too, was including tutorials in the product, like our actual product tutorials, where if we were talking about something payroll related, for example, we could put a tutorial, embed a tutorial video in there, and then it would give people the ability to test drive if you will, uh, what the product was. Yeah. And we did start seeing a little bit higher conversion after that. Now, you had a lot of experience with this over at Hotjar. Do you have any specific examples of what that was like? Yeah, of course. And also, just the point is, just incorporating the product is not enough. Because yes, if you're not doing right, you will come off as salesy, you will come off as like pushy. And we've all, we've all seen it when the product is kind of shoehorned in and you're halfway through a piece and there is a CTA that starts blinking at you. And that's not what we're talking about when we're talking <laughs> about product like content. <laughs> Just to be clear, we're talking about weaving the product in into a piece of content seamlessly so that it's actually part of the story that you're trying to tell. And the way we did it at Hotjar was simply we're trying to figure out how the products, which had many features, so there was a lot to choose from, but how the product would help people do something that they were reading about. So one example, for example, is um, we wrote a guide to user personas, which is your typical top middle of the funnel guide, which is about what is a user persona, why it's useful, who uses it, how to do it, etc. And we wrote the story after talking to a customer who had used Hotjar to create their own personas. And so right in the middle of the story, after defining the personas and explaining how you do them, we had a section that says, by the way, if you're using Hotjar, this is one approach that you could take. You could set up a survey. You could collect these answers. You could actually, you could ask these questions. You could collect these answers. This is what it would look like in your dashboard. This is how you could analyze the data. This is what the persona could look like at the end of this. And we used the real example from our customer because they'd actually told us exactly how, um, you know, how they'd done it. But the customer story could have easily become a tutorial of how to do personas with Hotjar. We just took it one step further, which was how to do user personas. And by the way, Hotjar is a really good way to do it. So it's, it's a subtle difference, but it was really good because it allowed the, the guide to rank really well for we chose SEO as our distribution method. So it drove a lot of traffic. It drove a lot of signups because somebody coming with the question of how do I even do this thing? 
just saw the solution right there and there, knew that there was a product they could use, knew how to use it because we showed them exactly how to do it. Um, they didn't need to do anything else. If they needed a solution, they had it right in front of them. Well, and it solves the attribution problem I, in, in a way, right? Attribution is still going to be a challenge no matter what. But if you have this model, right, where you know what you're trying to do, you can track these signups a little bit more uh, in yeah. software. Now, what does that look like when you are looking at more of like a service-based thing? Yes. So product-led content as an approach is really easy to do when, you, when you're in the software business because you can just take a screenshot of the dashboard and just add it to the page, annotate it, and be done. When you're offering a service, it's a little bit more complicated because there is more, um, there is more intangible stuff around the service you offer. But at the same time, if you're a consultant or you know, whatever service you're offering, presumably you, you have some templates or you have some, I don't know, wireframes or checklists or things that you use to do your work and present results to your customers. And you could just show those things, even, you know, if you're, and we're going to see it in a bit when we talk about the piece. If you're running customer research interviews, you can show your notes, handwritten ones if you use them. You can show... I don't know, your Zoom window when you're talking to a customer, or you can show the template or the slide deck that you created for a, for a customer of yours um, to share the results. Like Whatever helps you make your work visible so that somebody wanting your help knows what to expect is good. It's easier to do with software, but it's not impossible to do with services. Right. And I want to talk about the easy framework uh, we have to move on to the next section of the show. Okay. So I'm actually going to put the link to the easy framework uh, in the replay and uh, it will give people an, a very concrete idea of what you're talking about. Actually, before we do that, what does easy stand for? And then... Okay. <laughs> so easy stands for expert, actionable, simple, and yours. It's a it's, I think this is one of my greatest contributions to the world of content marketing, just coming up with a cool <laughs> sounding framework that people can actually use. So I'm very proud of it. But essentially, it's a, set of, it's a, it's a small set of in-depth guidelines for creating content that is helpful and resonates with your audience, does its service, drives business, is educational, and all the things that we talked about um, before. So the principle is basically that you want to showcase expertise by being very specific about the things you talk about. You want to make it actionable. So as I was saying before, somebody reading your piece knows what to do because you show them or told them instead of leaving them guessing or second guessing what it is you're trying to imply. Uh, you want to make it simple, which is ironically the hardest thing to do because uh, making <laughs> things simple is really hard as we all know. Um, but the point is, yeah, you want to make sure that your audience understands what you're saying. So um, simple, simple sentences, clear sentences, no jargon, no buzzwords, and actually just be aware that you are the expert. So your, your job is to simplify things for people. And then there is the element of yours, because um, I think we, we, you've discussed it before. Uh, there is a lot of content that looks pretty much the same. Like a lot of pieces look like each other. And actually, sometimes... If you are reading a blog post and you remove the header, it's hard to know where you are. Like as you were saying mm -hmm. before, you know, you you can assume that people know where they are. I'm gonna say no because much like you, I don't remember what I was reading recently. I don't know. However, if there is a certain element of personality, uh, it can be style, it can be the presence of product. Again, product-led content. It'd be quirkiness. It could be anything, but something that makes it yours that makes it more memorable. I think that's. Um, that's where good content is. It's true. There's a whole political question to be asked around making it yours that I would love to get your take on in the follow-up, right? We can talk about mm -hmm. this afterwards, and I would love to uh, get your take on that. Of course. That said, we have to move into the next section. Let's talk about your process uh, for taking all of the information that we've gotten here, customer research, uh, what does a customer research process look like? And take us from ideation to publication. Yeah. So again, first of all, um, 
I would imagine that all this research is happening because we have a clear strategy. So we have a, a business goal of sorts and we know how to solve it. We've picked the right set of tactics. So whether it's a blog post, YouTube or whatever. So we've done research, but the research is not random. So it's informed by all of this. Um, in most of my work, I've worked with SEO as a primary distribution method. So in addition to all of that, there is an element of keyword research or understanding who else is already there, et cetera, combining all the information together and then creating content that is, as I said, expressive of this easy framework. So we're not trying to replicate what is already there. Ideally, I'd love for every piece of content to have either a su subject matter expert writing it or a subject matter expert being interviewed in one way or another so that there is an element of uniqueness that comes from that person and their knowledge. And then um, I'm not doing much of the creation anymore, but I used to do a lot. In fact, at Hotjar, I pretty much wrote anything that, <laughs> that needed to be written for years. Um, but I would do that. And then I was both the writer and the editor. So I would edit myself at this point or just ask somebody else on the team to review stuff. Again, if I looked in a subject matter expert, I would want their take because, just you know, <laughs> just to be safe. <laughs> um, right. Yeah. And I think the process is fairly simple. So there is a lot of research. There is a lot of writing. There is a lot of editing, perhaps more so than the writing, actually. And then we publish and we move to the next thing. Are you working off of like a big old keyword list or are you doing things as you're going along? I think, um, well, again, it depends on the company. Uh, back at Hotjar, we were working on a keyword list. But again, because we took a product-led approach, keyword was just one of the reasons or one of the the determining factors for us. Um, at the beginning, we were trying to just grow traffic and prove that it could be done because we started from nothing. We had nothing and we wanted to prove that content marketing was a valuable investment. Later on, when we de developed this product led approach or more than developed, I should say, we copied it from the folks at Ahrefs who had implemented it before we had. Um, something more important than traffic um, became part of the consideration. So we tried to score a potential topic on a scale from zero to zero to two, I think, based on how much of the product you could show. So you, you assigned a score of zero if there was no way to mention your product in a way that made sense. You scored it one. If there were, there were ways to mention the product, the product was maybe not the only solution to the problem, but it could have helped. And then we scored it two if the product was crucial to the solution, um, crucial to how somebody needing to do a job would do it using the product. And so we then, we chose topics that gravitated towards the number two or one. That sometimes meant going after small keywords or keywords with no volume. And it's a controversial thing to do because not everybody will agree with the fact that, you know, now you've grown traffic so much, now you're gonna stop because you're gonna want to do something else. But it worked um, because it gave us an opportunity to present the product always and is actually a, something that I've taken with me after moving away from Hodger, even now at Postmark, rather than going after enormous voluminous, voluminous keywords, I'll try to find something where I can show how Postmark can actually help somebody solve a problem. And if the volume is zero to 10, so be it. We're doing it anyway, because we're trying to help. Two questions. Sure. One. How are you likening that? Because I, I love the way you, you liken this to product placement inside movies and television. So I'd love to yeah. have you kind of walk through that metaphor. And then the second question is, how are you finding that balance in the calendar when you're starting to plan this stuff out? Okay. So let's talk about product placement. I think it's a good way to explain how, uh, how you can put your product in your content. So when you're watching a movie or an episode of television, there are different ways a product can show up. There is a first level, which I would call blink and you miss it, where the product is there, maybe in the background, and you may notice it, but also not. It depends because nothing is actively directing your attention towards it. So for example, it's a kitchen scene. There is a KitchenAid in the background and you as a viewer may or may not notice it. So that was the first, uh, the first level of product whereby you're reading something and there is no mention whatsoever of the product, but there may be a, one link somewhere. And if you manage to see this link and you click it, you might end up on a product page or a landing page that tells you about the product. So then can you miss it? 
The second level is a direct mention. So now in your kitchen scene, somebody's talking about how they got the KitchenAid for ber their birthday, or maybe the camera is zooming in on the KitchenAid and you as a viewer had your attention directed towards it. This happens in content when usually you get to the bottom of a piece, there is a giant call to action or there is a note that says, by the way, um, if you are trying to do this thing that we just ended up talking about, we have a service or we have a software that helps you do it. Click here and find out more. So now your attention has been directed towards it. Um, but you're still not really sure you know, what this thing is or what this thing does. And finally, there is a third level, which is uh, the integral part of the narrative where your product becomes, um, it's woven into the, the story as it's a crucial plot point. So for example, in your movie or TV show, um, the protagonist now needs to cook dinner for 20 people who unexpectedly are coming for dinner. There is a montage where the KitchenAid helps, helps them do whatever it is that the KitchenAid does. Um, but you're watching this, you understand what the KitchenAid does, what it looks like in action, you know how, what it's helping the protagonist do, and you're kind of sort of subliminally directed to think that should you ever be in the same situation, this would be what the solution looks like for you if you had the money for a KitchenAid or, you know, something similar. And this is the level where we're talking about product-led content, which is an integral part of the story. And so you see the product in action. It's a screenshot. It's an annotated screenshot. It's a video. It's a tutorial, an interactive tool, whatever it is. But it's part of the blog post or the guide or the content piece. And it's, uh, it's letting you see the thing in action. You're almost test driving it without really knowing it. And so by the time it comes to making a decision, if your decision moment comes at the end of the piece, great. And if it comes some other time, maybe you will remember because you've seen it in action so much at this point that there is a mental association with you, more so than if you just read a long page with no images, no mentions, no links whatsoever. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. A great example of this for me, that last one where it's integral to the entire plot, and this will show this comes from a, a very different time in my life, but there's the movie Harold and Kumar go to White Castle, right? It's right there in the title. The whole movie centers around them wanting to go to White Castle as the entire plot. And I, I think it, it's a really good example because after the movie, I wanted to eat White Castle. I've never had it before. So that was one of those things where it was like, that is very successful uh, marketing. I think one of the major things that's really cool about this philosophy is that it it eliminates this whole, when you start to think about it on these three different levels, it eliminates that anxiety around how uh, you can incorporate this, right? How are you able to start thinking about where you do a background mention versus an incorporated mention versus it centers around the entire thing. Yeah. Um, may I just say though that in in the this goes back to your second question you were asking. Right now, when I think about calendars and when I think about what to do, I ignore the background mention and or the direct mention, and I only go for things where I can absolutely put the product in as part of the story. So it's a good way to prioritize stuff. It, it, uh, I used to call it the hotjarability factor because of hotjar. Now I'm just going to call it the postmarkability factor. So if, if this potential idea, content idea, title, topic, whatever, has a postmarkability factor of one of two, it goes into the calendar at some point. If it doesn't, it's a nice idea, but look, we're a small team. We only have so many resources. We're not trying to be you know, HubSpot from 15 years ago. We're not trying to cover right. everything under the sun. We want to cover something that actually sh showcases our product and gives people a tangible sense of how it can be used to solve a pain point or to help them do a job that they need to do. And it's one of those things where I, when I consult, I tell people, you need to work backwards from the money, right? Mm. And if you're doing stuff that's closest to the money, you build this foundation of content and then eventually when you can get to the point where you get start to go higher on the funnel, then you can start to go like, well, we have this whole base of things to build off of and you have 
that lower part of the funnel. I hate the idea of the funnel, but <laughs> yeah, it it gives you that foundation to build off of instead of trying to reverse engineer it and go the other way around. I want to say that um, this product led approach to content to me sort of it works independently from the funnel. In fact, forget about the funnel entirely. This kind of content works for people who have a problem that they need to solve who are not yet customers, but it can also work for existing customers because as I like to say, just because somebody is already a customer doesn't mean that they know 100% of the functionality you offer and or is using them. And so some of these pieces of content can truly be shared with people who are already customers of yours and can give them ideas for things that they haven't done before and they can do, and this will help retention. So product-led content, even though we used it for acquisition, I, I have the strong feeling that it also helps retention. I have never been mm -hmm. able to prove it because attribution becomes really difficult at this point. We tried to do some cohort based analysis of customers who had seen it versus some customers who hadn't and tried to create some correlations with retention, et cetera. I don't want to spend too much time digging deep into the metrics. If I, I have the gut feeling that this is good because we get good feedback. We see people react positively, thank us for telling them how to use a product in a way that they didn't. So that's good enough for me. So kind of forget about the funnel and just do it because it helps. I actually have data to back that up. So when I was at Ooh. QuickBooks, we, uh, I worked with the most brilliant data scientist I've ever met and totally understood content. And he actually found the relationship between uh, retention and the stuff that we were producing. And it completely, again, it backs up what you were talking about. We found that the nice. lifetime value of an existing customer was 70% higher than a customer who hadn't interacted with our blog and content uh, overall. So there's definitely research out there to back that up, or at least I've experienced that research where you can, if you're, if you're setting up the complicated attribution model, which like most of us can, right? Um, <laughs> we just don't have the resources to do it. But rest assured that what you are saying has been validated at least with one study that I've been a part of. So This um, is awesome data. I'm really happy. Yeah, yeah. We're a little over time here, but I'd love to hear about your pregame uh, as we've gone from the bigger picture Let's talk about you have the content created now. What's your pregame? Uh, we'll say in about five minutes um, for getting into a piece now that you've thought all of this through. Yes. So I think um, the first thing I will do, let's say I've just received a draft. Um, I'll try to minimize all distractions. So I'll turn off Slack. I'll turn off music. I'll minimize my windows and just make sure that I'm focused and doing my job properly. So somebody in a previous episode said that they were sitting on their hands. I don't quite do that <laughs> because I'm always tempted to just start doing stuff, but um, yeah. I try to resist the urge. Um, one thing I will do, one thing I hope to do anyway, is to find an outline and or a brief to just familiarize myself with what it is that this piece is trying to do, who it's for. So I want to understand actually who the audience is, what their job what job they needed to do that this piece is helping them do. But I also want to understand what is the brand or what is, you know, the author of this piece trying to do for themselves? Like, how is this piece going to help them grow the brand, drive revenue, whatever business or goal we're looking at? Because without knowing these things, um, I find it really hard. I, I, I need to make assumptions. Um, and so as we will see in this particular example that I'm going to edit in a minute, I didn't have any of this. So I had to do a few major assumptions about who the person was yeah. and who they were doing it for. And I think this kind of does a disservice to the writer because had I had that information, I could have done a probably more targeted job. So I try to do that anyway, hoping that there is an outline, a brief. And then um, I'll look at the table of contents to see where we're going. Or if there isn't a table of contents, I'll look at the headings, kind of understand sort of the journey that I'm about to get on. And then I'll look at the introduction. And this is where I, I really do need to sit on my hands because um, <laughs> like somebody who was here a few weeks ago, honestly, I'm just tempted to just get in and do things done. Um, I like to joke and say that I will cut 75% of an introduction 90% of the time 
because I have strong opinions about <laughs> what an introduction needs to do. And most of the time, I'll just be reading an introduction and thinking, I'll get back to you later and we'll fix it. Yeah. And so then I continue and I, and I, I read the piece. And then when I'm done, um, instead of editing right there and then, um, I highlight sentences or words as I'm going through. So if I'm having a sort of reaction, uh, either positive or negative, I'll just highlight a word or a sentence to give myself a reminder. So then when I go for the second pass, I know the points where I stumbled, where I got interested or where I want to dig a bit. I think that's super cool. And one of the things that I've personally started doing, and I'm going to get into this because my episode is next week. I'm in the hot seat next Ooh. week. Um, one of the things that I've started doing, especially if something's a search-oriented uh, piece, and that's going to be our primary distribution channel behind it, is taking about five to 10 minutes or asking people for five to 10 minutes, write down why somebody would be searching for this, mm -hmm. right? Like what is, like literally list this stuff out. What's going on? What are the circumstances in their life? Why are they looking for this thing? So we can have an understanding of where their head's at when they land on the piece, right? It helps so much, I think, overall, because we give ourselves, it gives us more context to think about who it is we're creating for uh, overall. Now, we were just talking about jobs to be done, which ha, is a yes. perfect segue into this piece. So I'm going to pull this up real quick here, and we will get into the edit. I want to mention this thing uh, very quickly. So one of, once I'm done with all my edits, I will write a, a small letter or a small set of notes to the writer at the top of the page, which you see here. What I will also do is always record a four or five minute loom video where I talk the writer through the main points and then I kind of, I screen share and I, and I take them through because I think even though we're in the business of writing and editing, so working with a written word, sometimes as an editor, your words can come off quite brutal, even if you don't mean to. So I am assuming mm -hmm. that the person reading this letter might feel like I'm being brutal. And honestly, that's really not the case. I'm actually you know, I, I want to use a video to accompany it so they can actually hear the tone that I'm using instead of me using, you know, 75 laughing emojis to transmit the same, the same feeling. So this is what people are looking at right now is not the piece. It's just my letter to the writer after I was done editing the piece. Cool. So we've got the piece up here and let's just walk through high level uh, what your feedback is here. What was the first impression? Okay, so my first impression was from reading the title. Um, this is a beginner's guide for running JTBD, so job to be done, customer research interviews. Now, as such, as a, it being a beginner guide, I expected to teach people what the framework is, um, teach them how it works, give them some examples of how others have successfully used it, and as a bonus point, I expected to give the reader evidence of why they should trust this particular writer or this particular website. Um, however, as I noticed here, um, this was the only time JTBD got mentioned in the entire people, sorry, in the entire piece. And I wonder, do people even know what the acronym means? This is where the question of how is this piece distributed would have been important because if we're trying to use SEO as our primary distribution method and probably going after a keyword that is related to JTBD, then we probably needed to define it a bit better or in fact, define it altogether. In fact, again, there is no mention of this word again, but there's also no explanation of what the JTBD framework is and how it can help someone. So as a beginner, if I'm coming here, um, I'm looking for certain answers that are not quite there yet. So my main, my main feedback here was we're not quite there yet because there are some structural issues that are not helping people get what they presumably came here for. And there's some dissonance there, right? Like if you're looking at a beginner's guide, but then you're putting in acronyms, those acronyms, that's something people don't know that they need to know. Yeah. There is also an additional layer of dissonance in that, okay, beginner tells me about the level of 
you know, knowledge that somebody has, but it doesn't really tell me what their, <laughs> ironically enough, what their job to be done is when reading this piece or <laughs> what their role in a company is. Um, is this aimed at a founder? Is this aimed who wants to grow their business and utilize customer research as part of it? Is it aimed at the practitioner who has been hired to grow the business by doing the customer interviews themselves? Like There is a lot of th this lack of clarity about who the beginner actually is. Uh, means, again, I had to do some assumptions about my edits, but it could have been more focused had we defined at the beginning, not just that this was a beginner, but what type of role they occupy within an organization. All right, let's continue. Let's continue forward. We've got the first sentence here, and you've got some pretty strong feedback on the side. Yeah, I think it was a strong and concise first sentence. As I said before, I like to cut 75% from 90% of introductions, but I think this is a good way into the into the piece. It addresses the reader directly. So like, if you don't know who your customers are, you don't know what causes them to buy. Um, so you're guessing a lot. It's it's a very succinct encapsulation of the problem that somebody might have. So after this, then I'm expecting to hear that if the problem is you don't know what causes them to buy or you're guessing, there is a solution that allows you to stop guessing and actually get some data. And that would be a really nice segue into um, jobs to be done as a framework and jobs to be done interviews as a practice that can help. Um, unfortunately, what happens though, is that we're kind of, we're kind of adding an additional introduction where we're il illustrating the point with an example from JC Penny, which is, I think is a relatively well-known example of somebody who kind of tanked the business by making huge assumptions about their audience or the customers and not really validating them with any real people. The anecdote is interesting, but it's also about 750 words long. So instead of hearing about the jobs to be framework, I'm being taken onto a tangent about this very specific case study that side note applies to retail, but I was kind of feeling that this piece was for SaaS or tech companies because later on we mentioned SaaS primarily. So there is also a little bit of a disconnect in here between this example that I think illustrates the general truth of, you know, what, how you can mess up a business if you're not doing your research properly, um, and the specificity of somebody coming from a different background looking for information. Yeah, and I want to point out there too, because I like to do a lot of research on this type of stuff too, right? Uh, the introduction, and especially in this area where we get into this example so quickly, the research shows that the average adult reads nonfiction content at about 238 words per minute. And when we do the calculation on that with something like a 750 or so piece, it's taking per a person two minutes to get into the meat of the content of what this is actually about. Not that this isn't a great example. It's a fantastic example. It's just a, a matter of going, is this the right place for it? Exactly. Right. Actually, you know, I have a... I have a sort of personal pet peeve with a lot of business books where I feel like they should have been blog posts and then they mm -hmm. get stretched to the size of, of a book. This piece had the opposite problem in that I feel that this was easily two, if not three separate, separate blog posts, because this one is a good example that you could actually spin off separately to talk about the dangers of not doing research. So it's not like, um, it's, it's not bad, it's just not in the right place and it could easily be taken out pretty much as is and published elsewhere so that the audience just gets taken straight to the point rather than you know being taken onto a tangent. Yeah, and it, the, the post itself, the feedback that you gave me initially was 7,000 words. This piece is 7,000 words. It so <laughs> to, to, get the, to get the first piece of feedback from you, which was, 7,000 words, whoa, that's kind of like an intimidating factor all on its own. So I think yeah. it is intimidating for, for a reader more so than for me as an editor. Like, look, I think um, I'm not going to 
I don't necessarily have a problem with with the length of a piece if your audience specifically likes long form, well researched, well argued content. Just go for it. Um, on the other hand, I thought this is a piece for beginners, so this is a ton of information. And yes, maybe a beginner doesn't have any of it, so this is all good. But it is also a risk of accumulating so much information that somebody who's new to it gets lost unless this piece is incredibly well signposted, which I didn't necessarily think it was because when I looked for a table of content or the headings, they didn't really tell me, they didn't really tell a, a good, actually they did tell a good story, but they didn't tell a story structured in a way where each section would build on the previous one and add more information. There is a lot of, I keep using the word tangents because I think this is what happened here. The writer was extremely enthusiastic about this piece and you can really see it and they're trying to do the most comprehensive job possible but it's sort of hard to follow and then yes this is a uh, seven thousand words so it requires you if you were reading it properly like you said at the at the rate that you that you mentioned before that's like what 30 minutes my math yeah. is not great but it, it's a lot so you need to keep their attention quite a lot, assuming, of course, that they are reading it and not just scanning through to get to the main point. Yeah, and the, uh, I just want to point out here, too, because I don't want to knock on the piece. This is a great piece where pagination would be uh, great to have, or even something where it's, you know, if it is going to stay this length, you put a email capture box in here that says, too long to read right now? Set, you know, give us your email address and we'll send this to you in like five or six different emails, right? That would be nice. Yeah. Yeah. You can drip it over time and especially where it's a beginner's piece, you're respecting someone's time. All right, cool. So you say that this is where the piece should pivot towards the framework. Yeah. So yeah. actually, this is, the, this is the part where we have the 700 word story. So past the introduction and past the beginning of this example, we actually go really deep into the story of... JC Penny's failure, which again, as I said, could be spun off into its own piece because it's good context for somebody who's new to it. It's probably not the right position for a beginner's guide to um, customer research interviews. So we want to get to the point where we learn about how to run them or what they actually are, what they even look like. Yeah. Yeah. And, and that's actually a really great if you have that example, that's a really great way to segue into the top piece, right? And like, you know, talking about what happens when you don't do these research be uh, yes. bits. Uh, all right, so we're gonna scroll down a little bit. We've got the two-part strategy, a fair and square pricing scheme, failures do started sooner than expected, right? We'll scroll all the way down here. Mistake, yeah. learn from the lesson. How do you do more? Apart from laziness, are there other factors? All right, here we go. Right, so... Oh, wait. I love the pop culture reference question here. <laughs> yes. So, um, I accidentally know who this is, but I've never watched the show before. So, um, I kind of get the reference, but at the same time, this is only this is the only pop culture reference in this entire piece. So, I'm trying to understand what are we trying to convey here? Like what's what's the overall tone because so far it was very sort of professional expert analyzing the story of jfc penny you know offering the background etc now this is this is kind of i don't know addressing a potentially different audience now if if until now we were maybe talking to a founder or a business owner um i don't know this seems a bit different in tone i thought it was a little bit jarring i felt a little bit of a disconnect and i wasn't really sure why this was here. So I'm often, I'm trying to be nice with the words I choose, but I often ask my writers to cut pop culture references because I don't want to alienate anyone who doesn't get it. And I am not convinced that everybody always does get it. So if it's not explained, if it's just added here without much context, yeah, I think it may be a little bit alienating. Um. I will say this, 
and we've had this conversation in one of our early episodes, is that going to your easy framework, this might be one of those things that fits into the you section, right? Broader context, maybe this is something that person does on a regular basis. So it's true. very specific to that audience. It's true. But it's also, but also you might be alienating exactly what you're saying. You might be alienating new audience. So something to be think, aware of. I think this is a very valid point because again, we're looking at this piece in, a, in isolation, but you know, content doesn't live in a vacuum. Presumably this person or this agency has more pieces. And maybe when you look at it on the page, you kind of get the vibe a little bit better. Um, yeah. So yeah, you're right. I think it's uh, in isolation to me it was a bit jarring and potentially alienating. But if this is something that this person does or is known for, then of course, go for it. Yeah. It's your brand after all. Cool. All right, let's move into here. Why so much hesitation to do research apart from laziness? So I thought this was, this was a, an interesting choice of words, and I thought it was maybe a bit judgmental insofar as this article is probably aimed at people who haven't done it before because they're beginners after all. Maybe they didn't even know it was a thing. And maybe suggesting that laziness is a factor. Um, I don't know. I just, I felt it was, I felt it was a bit judgmental because again, the JC Penney's example, it, it, it did speak to laziness, let's be honest, but it's also a, a limited circumstance. And actually more so than laziness, it just spoke about arrogant assumptions in a way. So I, I thought this was um, potentially a strong word. But again, as you said before, if this is a person known for their strong opinions, their controversial takes, etc., and they're unafraid, then by my easy framework, they're doing, you know, you're doing you. So good. Just, I just wanted to alert them to the possibility of people feeling a bit judged if they perceive themselves included in the laziness element. I would say that's something to be really aware of too, especially where the audience here is supposed to be beginners, right? Like, yeah. Like, I, I, I wouldn't want to feel lazy if I just didn't know the answer that I'm here for. So, all right, let's keep going. All right. So here where I think we're, I don't, I don't know how many words we're in at this point, maybe like about a thousand or so. But we're saying here, after working and speaking with hundreds of founders and marketers, I've also come through the web to see where people are struggling. So hang on a minute. You worked and spoke with hundreds of founders and marketers. Why are we not hearing about this? This is awesome. This is excellent. This is a first and example that resonates probably more than the JC Pennies because it's steeped in your expertise. I have so many questions. I want to hear more. And this actually tells me that you're qualified for telling me the rest of the story because you've been there, you've done it. It's great. Put it at the top of the introduction. This is one of the things you could lead with. And yeah, this is where we feel like it might be a second blog post too, because now this yes. is my first impression when we got here is in this article, you will learn like we're just now getting started. Exactly. So this would probably be the second or third sentence in your intro. So this is where I'm saying that a loom video would make it sound far less brutal. But in my notes at the top, I say, cut the first 800 words and start here. Um, because this is excellent. This is great. This is what I was actually looking for in the introduction. So I'm super excited that we finally got here. Unfortunately, you might have lost some of your audience who was, you know, trying to figure out what this article was about and hadn't been signposted um, all the way up to the page 15 or however many hundreds of words ago. Right, right. And then let's move forward here. But that's not all because our interview techniques are somewhat different from those widely practiced. Oh yeah, this this keeps getting better. You know, this is where, where I'm hearing like, okay, so you've talked to hundreds of marketers and you presumably have developed your own system, which is different from everybody else. So this is your unique take. This is amazing. Why aren't we not leading with this? So at this point, I think um, I'm, I'm really sold now. Um, and now things become difficult because you've promised a lot so now I'm going to expect you to deliver and to show me how your expertise comes through and give me evidence of 
the work you've done and how different it is from everything else. And it, this is this is one of those really great places. It goes back to the product led stuff where now you're leading with your expertise, right? Now you're starting to yes. get to that point where now you're leading with the expertise and you're setting me up for going, I know, you know, or at least you're giving me the idea that you know yeah. what you're talking about. So now tell me, right? <laughs> And so. also, don't also sorry, don't just tell me, but show me as well. This would be great if you had, I don't know, did you make notes when you were talking with these hundreds of people? Just screenshot some of them. Show me the work you've done. I, I think this just makes it so much more relatable and so much more unique and personal. And now I have a connection with you. That's great. Just do more of this. I think this is really a, a really good direction at this point. All right. You'll... You'll will learn. Ah, uh, just run it through Grammarly. Run it through Grammarly. Just a wink. <laughs> <laughs> All right, before we begin. Ah, uh, yes. So this is another small tangent. So I'm, I'm really primed here to hear about customer interviews, but now you're taking me on a separate journey to talk about what customer, how customer research is different from market research, and you know, there is, there is more information added. So th this is interesting to me insofar as we're spending time defining some concepts, but we're also spend spending time not defining others. So for example, here we have like a 300 word description of what market research is. Later on, we talk about churn and we, we don't even say what it is. So I think there is a little bit of an imbalance between the amount of information that is provided and the topics that the writer chooses to expand upon versus sort of move on from really quickly. Again, one of my recommendations would be to cut this, um, maybe add it to a separate piece, or, you know, if, if somebody wants to understand how customer research is different from market research, they can do it in their own time, but not in this piece because the focus is elsewhere. Right. And you're saying the reader is likely getting impatient. We're 1500 words in and we haven't talked about jobs to be done yet. Yeah, I, I, I think it's probably a fair assumption. Again, seeing as this is a beginner's guide for running JTBD customer research interviews, and we've, we've sort of talked about the, the problem. So the problem is you need to understand customers, otherwise you're just guessing uh, at what they're doing. You've given me a proof of your authority. You've, you've done this you know, I've talked to hundreds of people, you have your own method. Now you need to kind of deliver on this premise and show me what the thing is, what it looks like, how, how it works, how you do it, so I can learn from you and do it myself. Or if this was the intent of the piece, so I can hire you to do it on my behalf because I don't have time, I don't have the expertise, and you clearly know what you're doing. So I can just delegate it to you. If the goal of this piece was potentially for this person to get a customer or a lead or, you know, some sort of deal with somebody who needs practical help running interviews. If you were to, if you were to wrap it all up and, and give us the, the quick two minute version of it, what would that be? Okay. So I'll just go back to the note that I wrote the writer actually, uh, where I tell them that basically I think, um, the piece is not quite there yet for, uh, mostly for structural issues. So I would recommend that first of all, they need to clearly define the topic that they're talking about, in this case, JTBD customer research. So, and follow a specific order, define what it is, why it's important, how it can help. Then I would rethink the outline to better fit, fit with the audience expectation. And here is unfortunately where we have to cut quite a lot of stuff as we saw before, but don't just cut and lose it. You can just spin it off in separate pieces and interlink them to one another. So. I know it's hard to, you know, when you hear that you need to cut a lot of your work, but you don't have to throw it away, just position it elsewhere and that will be fine. And then uh, because you talked about your own expertise, just show it. Add first and examples. They are probably better than examples about other companies that everybody already knows about. Your unique take, whatever makes you unique and expert is what adds value to the piece and makes it different from everything else. And this is how I would summarize it. Also, good job, because I know for a fact writing six or 7,000 words takes a lot of time and effort. So well done for you actually doing it and getting to the end of it, because oof, it must have taken you quite a lot of time. That is a lot of stamina to get through yes. that many <laughs> words. So Absolutely. 
Well, Theo, where can we find you online? Where are you spending most of your time online? And how can we get in touch? You can find me on my newsletter, which is contentfolks.substack.com. I think that's the right link. Um, and from that, you'll understand that I'm not really good at spending time online. So you're not going to find me on Twitter necessarily, maybe more <laughs> on LinkedIn. Just look me up. I'm really bad at social in general. But my newsletter, you'll find me there. And then if you email me, um, I'll reply. I reply to every single person who emails me. Amazing. Theo, thank you so much for coming on to the show today. I really appreciate you taking the time. And then if you want to get updates uh, about future episodes or uh, replays of previous episodes, also exclusive bonuses that we have from other companies that we've been working with, go to thecontentstudio.com forward slash the cutting room hyphens in between and you'll get notified about everything else that's coming up. Thanks so much for watching. If you liked that episode, please leave a comment and a like down below. And if you want to be notified about future episodes, please go to thecontentstudio.com forward slash the cutting room, enter your email address. You'll also get replays and other exclusive bonuses. Thanks again, and we'll see you in the next one.